Sir, good morning, my friend. Preacher John out here in Broomfield, Colorado today. This is the uh, first Thursday of the month. I'm scheduled for Broomfield, so that's where we are. We just got here five minutes ago or so. And uh, we're in front of the uh, Starbucks right there. And then right behind me is a Circle K. And then over on this side, he'll be behind me, Walgreens. Anyways, uh, just wanted to say hello. If you can see me, a lot of shade here. But uh, one, of the, one of the things that we street preachers need when it's hot is some shade. So because of this tree right there, we got a lot of shade. Uh, so it's wonderful. Anyway, just wanted to say good morning and, and I'll put this down and do my scripture short and then my street sermon. Then I'll relift the banner and do what I do out here on the street. So uh, thank you for uh, joining us and praying for this street ministry. I appreciate it very much. Also, thank you for praying for our missionary church. Amen. Thank you. See you in a little bit. channel welcome to uh, Broomfield welcome to this is US 287 and uh, Midway Midway Boulevard yeah, Boulevard Midway Boulevard and uh, 287 as you know I'm lots of different cities on this road here uh, from Fort Collins up the north part of Colorado all the way to the southern end of Colorado to Trinidad even though US 27 doesn't go that far but uh, 25 does so uh, let's begin in prayer. Lord, I thank you that we can come where you send us. Uh, we can come to another city, as uh, long as it's where we're, you know, another city, and wherever we go in that city, you'll tell us where to go in that city, and uh, that's where we'll go. And we'll do what you want us to do, not what we want to do or where we want to go, but we'll go where you want us to go. We'll say what you want us to say, and we'll be your representatives here in the city at the location that you have planned for us because this here, like right now in Broomfield, at this location, is where you wanted me today, on this day of June. And I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for uh, blessing us in class this morning. What an unusual class, Lord, a very peculiar class, but uh, I enjoyed it. And I thank you, Lord, that you're touching all kinds of people, even the bus driver, Stephen. And Lord, I just thank you for blessing Stephen and that bus right there. I thank you, Lord, for helping him. Uh, Steve is his name. And uh, we just thank you, Lord. Uh, we ask your peace on Steve, our bus driver, and uh, because of so many deaths in his family so, so recently in the last two years. It's amazing, all the people who have died in his family. But uh, uh, he's 62, and he's still trucking along with his wife. So we thank you, Lord, for Steve and RTD. In your name, Jesus, we humbly pray. Amen. So uh, just a, another brief here. So right, I have a... In my, these pants here, I have a little pocket, side pocket, and uh, I've tried all kinds of things out here on the street with prayer books. So our prayer book, I've mentioned it many, many times, our prayer book is not a book of prayers. It's a book, now you can put prayers in it, I always say that too, because you know, I'm not telling you what to do. But our prayer book is a book of names. And uh, the idea with that is sort of like the title was in our class this morning, uh, Thursday morning. And that is, uh, uh, what was that? It was in Philemon chapter one. Let me just read that. It just came to my mind to read that verse, verse in Philemon. It's just one verse long, one chapter long. By Philemon, oops, went too far, sorry. There's Titus, it's the next book after Titus, one page. Philemon says here in the first, uh, No, verse 4, sorry, verse 4 in Philemon. Uh, it says, I thank my God, making mention of thee, making mention of thee always in my prayers. I'll do it one more time. I thank my God, so this is Paul speaking, making mention of thee always in my prayers. So 
That's just one of many examples of Paul telling us how he prayed. He mentioned people's name to God. And so, just like I just did here, simple little prayers. And sometimes I just mention people's names. I'll just go through, I lift Steve up, I lift the guy, this, this, and I'll just start naming names. Name after name after name after name, or location, or oftentimes what I do nowadays, because of the volume of names, is I just lift up the whole book. And in the book, God knows who's in the book. And oftentimes, God will bring several people, just like this morning when I was praying over my prayer books, a lot of names came to my mind and I was praying for each one of them individually for like, you know, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, not very long, just like we heard here, you know, just a short little prayer. Because if you make it too difficult, you make it too hard, you just draw out your prayers really long and ornate, and you just go on and on and on, you'll wear yourself out. You will. You'll stop praying because it's too hard. But if you do what Paul says, I mention thee daily. Thee being singular, being a name. I mention you daily. And uh, in your prayers. So in Paul's prayers, he mentions people's names. And that's what we teach at Gospel Evangelist Church. It's one of the nine tools that God gave us to build our church. So if God gave us that tool, that's the tool that we use. We don't copy somebody else. We talked about that in church last night. Stop copying people. Do not copy. Now you can look what other man's doing as education and knowledge to figure out how to do things, but then you go with the Lord and allow Him to go on because they, the Lord probably bought that, brought that ministry into your life to educate you for a season, all right? And uh, kind of go with that, right? <laughs> this is a very busy location and it gets very hot. And uh, all right, so that's enough of that. Prayer book, remember your prayer book. I also want to touch on uh, Proverbs chapter six. I just did the scripture short a moment ago and it was on Proverbs six, verse six. It says here, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. Now, I didn't go any further, but let's read the next to the verses. I'll have a little more time here. It says, verse 7 says, Which having no guide, or overseer, or a ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, gathereth her food in the harvest, how long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and they want thy want as an armed man. So the want of an armed man. An armed man means a thief with an armed weapon of some sort, a weapon of some sort, and that becomes your, what does he call it? Your want. And that want overtakes you. You have no recourse because he has a weapon. That want has a weapon. <laughs> that want has a weapon. And you have to surrender. And that's because you didn't obey the word of God. We talked about that in class also. I really highly encourage you, if you're really serious about growing in the ministry, not just curiosity, but taking advantage of real growth in the ministry, real growth in your Christian walk and service unto God, can attend our True Study class, or Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Now, I understand a lot of people can't come during those times. That's mountain time. I live in Boulder, Colorado. But they're, they're all recorded, so you can watch the recording. But uh, uh, it's just more fun to be on the live stream because, you know, I'm, real, I'm right there in the morning and it's just kind of interesting. But, uh, and with the class, we have a book, and that book helps us go through the Word of God. That's the idea with the book. And uh, a lot of people say, well, I don't need a book, I just read the Bible, or whatever they say. Well, our book just doesn't take you through the Bible. So this true study is not a Bible study. It is a church school that we're building for our church and for ministries and other churches. Yeah. It's not about us, it's about the whole body of Christ. That's what this sermon's all about. It's not about our church. 
It's about all the churches here in the city of Boulder, the city of Broomfield. Tomorrow I'll be in Denver. It's about all the churches in the city of Denver. So our church travels to different cities, 17 of them. Next Tuesday, the Lord has me scheduled for Vail, Colorado. So I'll be in the churches that are in Vail. I'll go there and minister in the churches, not in the churches, but for the churches that are in Vail. See? So that's what we do. That's not normal for most churches. Most churches are all about themselves. They don't care about the church across the street. Now, they may say that, they care about them, but do they really? So, uh, and one idea, one, um, uh, what can I call it, a one uh, sign following, I guess, I don't know, is uh, we have members, not members, but we have people in our church who come to our church faithfully who attend other churches. See, so we're ministering to the members of other churches because they come to our church and they get built up. They get touched by the Lord. They grow and then they take that knowledge and they go to their church. That's pretty interesting. That's a type and shadow of our future. There's going to be people from all kinds of churches. We've had people from other churches, two other churches, fly into Boulder just to come to our church. And our church is just a little dot. You know, it's just nothing. It's just a little house full, house full of people. I mean, we have a church building, but uh, uh, it's just small. But we are, we're very dedicated, very committed. We're soldiers for Christ, ambassadors for Christ. And, uh, you know, we stay after it. We don't live in sin. We're holy. I mean, you know, whatever you want to say. We're just good, solid believers walking the faith, believing in the faith, and staying in the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... These are two examples, one about the ant and about, uh, what, did I, uh, what was I talking about earlier? Uh, ant and, oh, prayer book. Yeah, the prayer book, right here. And I got my pen right here. I always have a pen on you. <laughs> so your prayer book and looking at what the ants do, since kind of crazy, right? Copy the ant, there you go. <laughs> Don't copy a preacher, copy the ant. Because that's what it says right here, you know? And uh, consider her ways. I'll see it, read it one more time. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. How about that? That's incredible. Verse 7, I'll say it one more time. Having no guide, no overseer, no ruler, huh, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. I'll stop right there. You think about that. Why do you have to have somebody telling you what to do when you know what you're supposed to go do? Everyone really, truly knows what they're supposed to do. How do they know that? Because God put in every single soul a conscience. The voice of your conscience guides you and directs you. Your conscience is the voice of your spirit, your gut, that gut level feeling, that gut voice, that gut thing, the gut, the belly. Well, the spirit resides, I guess, or the soul resides, or something like that. That lets you know. But Paul cautioned all the believers and all the people. That he cautioned that says that you don't want to sear your conscience. Sear would be like putting a, a hard covering over your conscience. It's like how you put a steak on the frying pan and you sear both sides of the steak so the juices don't get out. That's searing, S-E-A-R, searing. And that searing, you don't want that in your conscience. You want to stay, uh, uh, flex, you know, you want to stay flexible. You want to stay uh, hearing your conscience. Because in your conscience, it helps you make the right decisions. And it's connected to your will somehow. I don't know how that works. Because your will is that decision-making apparatus in your brain that you can make a choice. You know, animals can't make choices. They live on instinct. We don't live on instinct. We have instinct because we're a creature, but we don't live by it because we're a living soul. Animals, the ants, are not living souls, for example. All right, so just points of interest here. Sort of what we do in our ministry is we bring up highlights, I guess you could say. Sorry I'm yelling, I talk so loud out here. It's hard for me to hear, and 
you know, it's just really hard. <laughs> but just letting you know, I'm not. I'm outside, and it's very busy. There's a lot of people out here. Even though on the camera it seems like there's nobody around, but if you stand out here, you go. There's a lot of people. You know, this whole parking lot's full. There's people looking through the window over here. All these cars. They'll look over. You know, we've already had a few. The firemen. They all looked over and waved. That's why I was waving to the fire truck. All right. So today is Thursday. This is our Sunday prayer letter. This is uh, the letter that goes out. I still highly encourage everyone to get on our Sunday prayer letter. Uh, it's our email list. And uh, all we do is send out the e this letter once a week. We don't ask for donations. We don't beg for any kind of help me. We're going out of business. I mean, we don't do any of that kind of stuff. We trust in God. And we trust in God because we are a giving church. Because we're a giving church, God provides. I can't tell you the number of people who have called me up or have sent me something or done something because God told them to do it. It's been amazing. So, uh, it's, so that's what this, this, a lot of people don't want to get on church newsletters because churches are always begging for money. And the reason they're begging for money is because they really aren't giving churches. Giving churches don't beg for money. They just have money. Where it comes from, they don't know. <laughs> they know it all comes from God. But a giving church doesn't beg for money. So at the moment you hear a church begging for money, you know that they're really not a giving church. They may have a lot of things going on, but they're not a giving church. They're a paying church. They pay their mortgage. They pay their staff. They pay their 401ks. They pay their insurance. They pay, pay, pay. But they don't give. They pay. There's a big difference between paying for somebody's service and freely giving something away. Big difference. So we don't pay, we give. That's why there'll never be a job offerings at Gospel Evangelist. We will never have an ad saying, we're, we're hiring, call us, we're taking interviews. We'll, we'll never be that way. We don't hire, we have no hirelings at Gospel Evangelist Church. Another point of interest there. That also makes a very weird church. Because if you talk to another minister, in fact, they come to me, says, who do you work for? What church are you with? And they really mean, what church do you work for? And I don't work for any church. Who do you work for then? Yourself? No. Really? Who do you work? I work for God. I work for Jesus Christ. Oh, well, that's obvious. That's what they say. Oh, that's obvious. But clearly it's not that obvious because you didn't say that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Oh, that's obvious. No, it's not obvious. <laughs> you may, th I don't say that. I'm thinking it. <laughs> I'm kind and respectful to everybody, okay? Like right now, we've got almost a half a mile of traffic. Stops here and it goes all the way down this hill, down that valley right there, and it goes back up the other hill. <laughs> it's crazy, right? I love where I, I love my job. I love where I'm at. And you know, when I first came to Broomfield, it took me 45 minutes of walking around I could. I got lost, and I went, Lord, I know you want me where you want me, or where you know. I, I could see it in my spirit. I could see it in my spirit, but I, I, was, I was all over the place, like 45 minutes, almost an hour. As soon as I saw here, I said, "That's it, right here." Actually, I stood up there in the corner because I was scared to stand close to this traffic. <laughs> uh, it's taken me a long time. It's taken me a long time to uh, overcome the fear of all the traffic. But I'm okay now. I'm okay now. All right. So uh, this is the Sunday prayer letter, and you can go on that letter. You can go to gospelevangelistchurch.com, c-o-m.com, and that's a one-page website to uh, to put your first name and your email, and you'll get two welcome letters, and then the following will be the Sunday prayer letter, whatever the next letter is. Uh, I do miss a couple, two or three, four of them throughout the year because I'm still the only one writing them. And I get wore out, I get beat up. And so I've missed several uh, this year. This has been a hard year so far on me. But, uh, you know, think about this for a second. Uh, this year, 2024, since January, I was looking at my calendar. I said, Lord, this has been the hardest year so far. Hardest being, uh, being hurt out on the street. I've been hurt more times on the street in these five months, this is the sixth month, but five months than I have been for other four years. I've been hurt, I've gotten sick, I've had all kinds of problems, sick-wise, physical problems, 
heard problems here on the street. <laughs> God bless you, man. And I don't get it, but guess what? Even though I've been hurt and sick a lot, the church is still growing. The ministry is still growing. And that lets me know that I'm not doing anything. I'm not building this. I'm not building this YouTube thing. I'm not building our podcast thing. I'm not building our email thing. I'm not building our, uh, all the stuff, other stuff we're doing. I'm not building the street ministry. I'm not building our church, our missionary church. God is, God is. So in your own ministry, Think about that. Are you trying to build your own ministry? It's, it's a serious question to ask the Lord. Lord, am I building my own ministry? And you'll listen. He'll tell you. And if he doesn't tell you right away, that means you're not ready to hear the answer. That's exactly what it means. If you ask those questions point blank, very clearly, very exact, what your challenges are, what your need and want is. And if he doesn't answer you immediately, that's why he doesn't answer you, because you're not ready. Then you ask the next question, Holy Spirit, help me to get ready, because clearly I'm not ready to hear the answer. And so you ask Holy Spirit for help to help you prepare to get ready to receive whatever God has for you, because that answer may be what you don't want to hear. Say. I didn't want to hear the Lord said, I want you to lift a banner. Well, not me, Lord. <laughs> Is that the devil talking to me? <laughs> I said, no way. I've told the story before. That, that's too scary. Ain't no way you're going to get me out there. <laughs> well, the Lord just, you know, the Lord just kept working, you know, because I wasn't able to receive it. And the Holy Spirit just kept working with me and working with me and working with me for about, I don't know, about, about five weeks, four, five, six weeks. And then one day the Lord said, that's it, get out the door, you're going now. Get ready to go. That was like Saturday night, Saturday afternoon, and I went out Sunday morning. And now it's been over five years. No big deal. All right, so let's go to Numbers 16.35. We're preaching on fire. 16.35 in Numbers. Hallelujah, Numbers. Where is it at? 1635, there it is. 1635, and there came out a fire. Listen to this. There came out a fire from the Lord and consumed 250 men that offered incense. So the fire came from the Lord. Where's the Lord? He's in heaven, the third heaven. Came from the throne, from heaven, all the way from the third heaven, the second heaven, the first, well, I don't know how it goes, first, whichever way you want to count, to earth, and specifically chose the 250 men that offered evil sacrifice, I guess you could say, because here it talks about offer incense. So it was something that the Lord told them not to do, but they said, I don't care, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. Where's the first real example of that? That's in Cain, Cain and Abel, right? Abel offered a, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to the Lord, something like that. But Cain said, I don't know, I'm not gonna do what dad told me to do, and I'm not gonna tell you, do what you tell me to do, God, because I'm not a, uh, a, a rancher, I'm not a shepherd, I'm not a herdsman. I'm a farmer, and so I'm gonna give you the fruits of my field. And God says, I, I don't want that. I don't care. It's still an offering. It's called an offering. Accept my offering. And God did not at all. He didn't bring the salt and pepper and the knife and fork, and he didn't devour it. He ignored it. And Cain knew he ignored the offering. That made Cain mad at Abel because he saw God accept and consume and take up the offering that his brother Abel offered. 
and and Satan came into Cain and made him jealous wicked evil jealous murderously jealous and guess what happened Satan came in we know as Satan because in Satan is 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 the you know steal kill and destroy you know John 10 10 first part of it but Abel operated in the second half of John chapter 10 verse 10 which is a it's a verse that everybody should be using all the time I've talked about it lately So the thief cometh not but to steal, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's part A of Chen 10, chapter of John. 10, 10, Ren 10, 10, you know the, and uh, the second half says, but I, the Lord Jesus Christ, have come to give you life and life more abundantly. All right? So, 250. We can talk on 250 for a long time, but I'm, not, I'm going to stop right there. Now we're going to go over to the, the connecting verse, or the other verse on the other side of the Bible, and that's at Amos 1.4. We'll go to Amos 1.4. I tell you, when we've been going through all these books, it has just really shocked me. When you try to find little books like Amos and Nehemiah and Obadiah, I mean, you have to really almost go back to the table of contents to find them because they're little itty bitty books that nobody preaches out of. But because we've been preaching on fire, the Lord's been going through book after book after book after book that almost seems insignificant to most preachers. But God, it's not insignificant to God, so God is using them. I think that's really interesting. Kind of gives you another clue of what God is doing at Gospel Evangelist Church. It really is. And so I'm asking for people for prayer is really important. If you can't give or you can't, I mean, not give, but I'm talking about, you know, giving your prayers, you know, giving prayers. If you want to give, that's fine too. You know, you want to attend, you want to come to the videos, you want to come to the class, you want to, and then if you come to these videos or these sermons and these classes, uh, show your acceptance or your presence by what they, the, the tools that the network gives you to indicate your interest in the video. And the, you do that by watching the whole thing. That's very important. That's the number one metric now. The number one thing that the video networks look at is the view length. How long do the people watch the show? Very important. It used to be other things, but nowadays in the last several years, that's the biggest metric that they're looking at, the biggest indicator to the network because what they want to do is provide to their audience what the audience wants. Not what the presenter, me, is wanting, but what the audience wants. So it's not about what I want, it's what the audience wants. So the only way for me to find out what the audience wants is me to deliver my message to God. And so I listen to God and I preach to the Lord. I might, it might look like I'm preaching to you or talking about the Bible to you, but I'm actually, in reality, from my own standpoint, I'm ministering to the Lord. Amen? And I'm allowing the Lord, or I'm asking the Lord, to minister to you. That's how I'm doing it. This way and down. Because <laughs> if you look to me for your ministry, I'm not God. I'm not Jesus. I'm just another servant just like you. And the job that I do is to point you to God. Look to God, look to God, look to God, look to God. That's God our Savior. Who's our Savior? Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Word of God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. A lot of people don't get all that, but that's all right. People are learning, people are growing. Okay? So uh, let's go to Amos again, uh, chapter 1-4. So actually, Amos 1-4 is where we got our title for our Sunday prayer letter. And the title was, I will send a fire, period. I will send a fire, and I have in parentheses a statement I made, or the Holy Ghost gave me, I didn't make it up, it said, do you know why, question mark, I will send a fire, that's what the Lord said, and then I asked the question, do you know why, why did God send a fire in 
numbers here that I just read also in Amos. Why did he do that? And if you've been following along since January 1st on the, all the sermons on fire, you know exactly why he sent the fire. You know exactly why he sent the fire in these cases. Because we've learned that fire comes to consume his offering. Other fire comes to protect, preserve, to keep clean, to keep holy, I guess, protect. Other fire comes to destroy, right? That's what happened to these 250. Same way in Amos 1.4. 1.4 says, where's it at? But I will send a fire. I will send a fire. You know, and I want to highlight one more time because I accidentally deleted my Sunday sermon. I came out to 20th and Pearl on Sunday. Had a great time on Sunday. Really a great day. Lord moved me to, a new, to my sum, summer corner. And it was nice and shady. It was a beautiful day. <laughs> because across the street where I'm at, it was hot, blistering hot. But I was cool and comfortable the whole day. But I accidentally deleted my sermon. I'm really sad about that. But I, before, I, before I backed it up, I deleted it accidentally. I pushed the wrong button. And I wasn't thinking. So, so I talked on Amos. Amos was not a prophet. He was not a priest. He was not a minister. He was a herdsman. His dad wasn't a prophet. Yeah, his dad wasn't a preacher. And you think about that. You know, I'm not either. I'm a truck driver. I'm a truck driver. My dad was a bartender all of his life. We had, you know, the last, for many, many years, we owned our own bar, our own, you know, neighborhood bar. Very busy, very, you know, packed. A bar kind of like in the the sitcom that I never watched. I think maybe I watched it once, I think, I don't know. But uh, called Friends, you know, they all gathered around the bar. Well, that was my dad's bar. That Not that bar, but the Lakeview bar that we had, uh, that was what it was. It was a neighborhood bar. Everybody came, and that was like the meeting place. And it was a wild place. My mom was a bank teller. She worked for the bank for over 30 years. Bank teller, and she had different jobs in the bank, but she's primarily a teller. My grandparents, on my mom's side, uh, my grandpa was a railroader for 50 plus years. And uh, my grandmother was a socialite. My grandfather was vice president of Southern Pacific Railroad, uh, the freight division down there in Los Angeles. And so they made a lot of money, and. Mom, my mom, grandmother was a socialite. She was in all the social clubs, you know, doing fundraising and all kinds of things like that. She was very high, you know, had big home, fancy cars, all that kind of stuff. But they weren't preachers. In fact, my grandpa didn't even want to hear about Jesus until he was in his 80s, because I wouldn't shut up. <laughs> Preacher John would not shut up about Jesus. He shut me up every time I saw him, and I saw him a lot, because I lived with him for a long, long time. But that was a long time ago. But my grandmother did know Jesus. She just didn't talk about it. She was a closet Christian, but she loved Jesus and she was saved. And my grandfather finally accepted Christ when I last time I talked with him and prayed with him. On my dad's side, on my, yeah, my dad's side, my grandfather was a horticulturist. He was a gardener, but he was a high-ranking gardener at the uh, Huntington Library Estate there in Santa Anita. I think it's Santa Anita. By by the racetrack, whatever racetrack there is out there. Really big, fancy one, old one. Uh, right around the corner there, that's where they made the Tarzan movies and all that kind of stuff. Huge estate. So that's the Huntington Library, the Huntington Estate. My grandfather ended up working there for over 30 years and uh, being the head gardener of all those grounds. He was the top dog, I guess. Eugene was his first name. He graduated from the University of Brussels, Belgium migrated over to uh, Montreal, Quebec, married my grandmother, which was a concert pianist for the Toronto Symphony in the late 1800s. And that's where my dad was born, in Montreal, Quebec. And then eventually they moved to Los Angeles, and that's where my grandfather took the job at the Huntington Library. And I don't, my grandmother didn't work, but she died right after that. I don't know if, I think she died right after they moved or right before they moved. 
She died of uh, breast cancer as a very young girl, very young lady. My dad was two years old when my grandmother died, and my grandfather never remarried. And my dad was an altar boy at the Catholic Church. No, she must have came down because she was the organist at the Catholic Missionary House, the Catholic Cathedral in San Gabriel, the Cath San Gabriel Mission. The San Gabriel Mission was my grandmother, Etta, was her, no, not Etta, um, I, I don't mention her name that often, but she was the organist there at the San Gabriel Mission, and she's buried there at the San Gabriel Mission in their little tiny cemetery plot. That's right, so she did move down, and shortly after that, she died of breast cancer. Uh, back, uh, when was that? That was probably about 19... Uh, uh, 20, I say, must have been around 1929. Yeah, because my dad was born in 27, so uh, 1927. So, little history there, right? So I'm nobody, really, to think about it. Gardeners, organ players, piano players, you know, uh, bartenders, you know, bank teller. I got nothing going for me. But one thing I do have going for me. I have the call of God on my life. So do you. If you're born again, you have the call of God in your life. And the first calling is traffic. I mean, it's backed up all the way down to the bottom of the hill and up the other side. The call of God on your life is to receive Christ as your Savior. So you've answered that calling if you're here and you're born again. If you're not born again, why not? Why aren't you answering that calling? Your phone is ringing. Ring, 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 ring. Come, answer the phone. Don't let it go to voicemail. Don't let it go to voicemail. And don't look at the caller ID. Because if you look at the caller ID, it says God on it. <laughs> God is calling. A God, uh, you may not want to answer it. Because you know what he's going to say to you. But you want to pick up the phone. You want to pick it up and say, yes, sir. Hello, whatever, you know, I do. You want to, you want to answer the call of God in your life. You really do. Now, I talk kind of funny. I talk in kind of weird terms, but I talk street talk in a sense. I don't like, I'm not one of those preachers who quoting all the Bible verses verbatim. God's never had me do that. And I don't do that. And I still have a lot of fruit. So you have to do what God has told you to do. And I've tried memorizing, I've told you that before. But uh, you know, if God told you to memorize the verses, you better be memorizing the verses. And if God tells you to use the verses the way I'm telling you to do it, then you do it the way God's telling you to do it. So I talk a little differently. But that keeps, when I, the way I talk about witnessing and all the stuff I do in the ministry, because what I'm doing is, now I'm not preaching a sermon per se, I'm teaching you how to live a wise life in Christ with understanding and with the knowledge of the Word of God so that you'll be fruitful and multiply in your life. All right? I hope you get that. So that's why people don't get me. But the reason I talk the way I talk is because people tend to listen a little longer. <laughs> a little longer, not much longer, but a little longer. <laughs> Because once you start quoting Bible verses to them, they shut their ears off. They stop them, hey, I don't want to hear that. But when you start talking, what I call street talk, they don't know what you're saying, but you're delivering the Word of God because, <laughs> because God knows <laughs> that guy hanging out the window of his truck. <laughs> Praise God. I see him, this truck right here, I see him when I'm in Broomfield, when I see him in Lafayette. And I saw him yesterday up on Canyon. How about that? Amazing. And now he's waving. He didn't used to wave, but now he waves to me. That's why I did this to him. All right. <laughs> so very important, answer the call of God in your life. Do not let it go to voicemail. See, that kind of gets people thinking, well, go to voicemail, how? It's God gonna call, you know, it gets you thinking, kind of mulling things around, at least for a few seconds. 
And that's good. You won't get people thinking about God for a few more seconds longer. But once you start quoting some Bible verses, I mean, like unless you, God tells you to do it that way, but for me, because I'm already such a sharp, kind of a cutting type of minister, because I have a very sharp tongue, I have a very sharp spirit, I have a very sharp presentation of my ministry, and that that does people like don't like that. They, they don't like it, but that's how God uses me. So God tempers that sharpness by the phrases that I use, the words and selections and stories that I tell. So that's what I'm doing. I'm giving you an example here. So, so don't put, don't copy, don't copy me, don't copy somebody else. But be who God made you to be. That's the calling that's on your life. God called you to be you because you are the most important person. He died just for you. He died for you. Do you believe that? I hope so. Do you think he died for everybody but you? No, he died for you, man. For God so loved the, you know, it's, he loves you, man. He just, he, he, he's not mad at you. He's not angry at you. He can't, he's not waiting for the big billy cup to hit you over the head. You know, I know a lot of preachers preach that way, and that is the God of wrath, the severity of God, and the anger of God, and the fire of God. We just read that over here. We're not ignorant to that wrath and that judgment of hell fire. That's obvious. And most people know that. Most people know that. All you got to do is look around and look around your life. There's so much hatred, so much condemnation, so much struggle, so much pressure, so much struggle that people just want to hear something good for a while. I just want to hear something good. Because everybody looks at everything out here and they think it's all because of God. Nobody knows anything about Satan. They'll blame everything on God. And so when you start preaching God in a hateful manner, in a wrathful manner, in a vengeful manner, in a condemnation manner, they say, yeah, he's from God. This is all God. That's why he's a judge. See, that's why people get turned off. And so, but people enjoy listening when you speak about the love of God. Because they already know that God hates them. <laughs> Not really, but God is already, and you know, he's got their number, I guess you could say. And when they say God hates it, God, they know people have a conscience. Remember, I talked about conscience. People know in their heart when they're doing something wrong. If the freeway is 65 miles an hour and you're doing 95, you know you're doing something wrong. You know you're doing something wrong. Because what are you doing? If you're doing 95 down a 65 freeway, what are you doing? You're looking around for the cops. Where are the cops? On the radio, you're looking around, you're looking around for the cops because you're speeding. You know you're doing wrong. See? Even if you didn't see any signs that said 65, you know about what the speed limit is on most freeways. Now, I understand some freeways are higher than 65, but I'm not talking about that. Just add 30 miles an hour to any speed limit you have. So let's say you're in Arizona, it's 75 miles an hour. So now you're doing 105. That's pretty fast. Now, to me, that's not fast because I understand I'm from Nevada. Now, when I was raised in school, Nevada, the state of Nevada, had no speed limit outside the city limits. No speed limit. I remember leaving Reno because we lived outside of Reno, way out 20 miles out of town. I oh, bless you, man. 20 miles out of town. And I remember distinctly because, you know, I had my own car when I was 16. And I remember driving, in, you know, into the into, end of city limits would be a sign. End of city limits. And the very next sign after the end of city limits would be end of speed zone. Now, most people. That's like, what? End of speed, that's right. No speed limit. You could do 150 miles an hour down the road. And that's, you're not breaking the law. Because the law states in Nevada at that time, when I was in high school, that there was no speed limit. So how did the state patrol, the highway patrol in Nevada, pull people over and give tickets? 
especially way out there in the desert. Straight road for 100 miles seems like, 50 miles, 20 miles, straight road, and you're doing 120 miles an hour. Now sometimes the cop will just let you go because there's no problem. So the cops in Nevada, they're trained to look at all the conditions around and they determine if the speed violates the surrounding circumstances and situations that are around them. And if everything's cool, 120, no big deal. 100, no, no problem. But sometimes you can be doing 50 miles an hour, 60, 70 miles an hour, and they'll pull you over and give you a ticket because the conditions at the time don't warrant going that fast. And so that's what we do as ministers. A lot of people think that the, once they receive Christ, it's the end of the law. It's the end of the speed limit. End of law, I can do whatever I want now. I'm saved. Uh-uh. So we are trained as ministers to survey. See, that's mocking. Can you tell the difference between somebody honking and waving for praise and somebody honking because they hate you? Because he wasn't honking in the car in front of him. They, I recognize that. That I like that. I want that. Remember I talked about it yesterday, if you listened to yesterday's sermon. Or Ninth and Canyon sermon. Did I post that already? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm about a day behind in my sermons. <clears throat> so we are ministers in today's world. What we do is we are the state troopers of God <laughs> and we look at the situations around and we pull people over and give them tickets for sort of like because they're going in a direction and a speed and an action and a mannerism that doesn't warrant that kind of action and see people don't like those type of preachers they want to go to a church and a preacher and a minister and a pastor who lets them do whatever they want to do. Last night in church, I had to be a pastor. I had to be the leader and had to step forward and do some correction. I didn't let anybody do whatever they wanted to do. I had to step in as a state trooper. Uncomfortable? Yeah, it's uncomfortable. But that's the way it is. That's the type of preachers that God is raising right now. So there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And we know that. That's what that George Floyd was all about. There's a wrong way and a right way. A wrong way and a right way to do the same job. Okay? And we talked about in church, <clears throat> the right way to do it is you do it out of the love of God. God's love is so full in you and your cup is overflowing with the love of God that when you give somebody a ticket, I'm just using that as an analogy, a ticket, they don't mind receiving the ticket. How many times have you been pulled over? I've been pulled over dozens of times. Not because of speeding. Have I? No, I don't think so. No. <clears throat> Except for one time way, way back. Now, understand also, well, I'm not going to talk about that in my past. <laughs> I was a shopper, right? I rode Harleys, you know. <laughs> I was always pulled over. I pull out of the driveway, a cop pulls me over. I got to just pull out of my driveway on that big old Harley chopper, and a cop would pull me over. I said, I didn't, what did I do wrong? <laughs> Nothing. It's just, it's just, we want to give you guys tickets all the time. <laughs> all right, whatever. <laughs> you know, long hair, chains, and leather, and all, you know, Harley, you know. I have my own bike shop, you know, so it's a beautiful bike. God bless you. Man. <laughs> All right, so. All right, 1 4. Oh, no, yeah, 1 4 in Amos. But I will send a fire into the house of Hazel, which shall devour the palaces of Ben Hadad. Right? Devour the palaces. You think about that. Those big old monstrous palaces that were built back or built in the Middle East. Jesus talked about that. Said, look at this. One of the disciples said, Look at Jesus, look at this beautiful temple. Man, isn't it something? 
Man, it's been here forever. This is Solomon's Temple. This is the second one. First one got, you know, I don't know. Anyways, this is, you know, this is, well, whatever it was, whatever temple they're talking about. Sorry about that. And what did Jesus say? He didn't care about the building because he knows that buildings get destroyed. He was probably the one who destroyed this palace. He's his God. He's probably the one that sent. It says here, I will send, I will, verse 4, I will send a fire on the house of Hazel, which shall devour the palaces of Hadad, not Ben Hadad. I will send a fire. The eye is probably the word of God. The word of God is the fire. When God opened his mouth, that fire came out because God speaks from the abundance of his heart. And Jesus Christ came from the bosom of the Father. So Jesus spoke that word, and that word devoured that. So Jesus said, this building is no big deal. I just speak a word. Palaces are destroyed. Houses are destroyed. Destroy this temple, and I'll raise it in three days. Now see, there's another example of talking odd talk, weird talk, talk that doesn't make sense, because that's not found in the Old Testament. I mean, I, not the way he said, I don't know, maybe it is. But in a, anyway, I don't like going too far into that because I'm not very good at that. But they didn't know what he meant. So if they didn't know what he meant, because he, the Bible calls us, he was referring to his death, burial, and resurrection. Destroyed this temple, Jesus was saying, and I'll raise it in three days. Didn't, they, didn't he say, I will raise it? I think that's what he said, I will raise it. But who raised the body of Christ? Did he himself raise it? The Bible says the Father resurrected Jesus. You see that? There's a lot of things going on in the body of Christ people aren't picking up on. Anyways. Something to think about, just to look at, just look at your Bible. And the Bible I'm talking about is the King James. All right? I'm done. <laughs> That's all right, I'll give you a little teaching real quick. So I finished that last word, that last sentence, and I noticed there was no more. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I guess I'm done. That's, what I, that's how I do it. So when the Holy Ghost ends the message, that's the end of the sermon. Okay, so let's pray. So Lord, I thank you that we can end the sermon. We can start the sermon, end the sermon as you lead us. We can do as you showed us. We can do as you taught us. We can do all the things that we do because we are in Christ by you, Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ lives within us. We operate and live in the Spirit. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Holy Ghost, for what you're doing in our lives, giving us the power to preach, the boldness, the boldness to preach, the power to witness, power to preach, too. Power to lay hands on the sick, power to cast out devils. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, I guess that's it. This is Broomfield, <clears throat> Colorado. I'm only gonna stay here till two o'clock because I'm still, my back is still very, very tender. I'm only about 95%. That extra 5% is, uh, for some reason, taking longer than I, I want. And then uh, I'll catch the bus. It's about an hour back home, and uh, hour here, hour back home. And then tomorrow, I'll be down there in downtown Denver. So if you happen to see this, uh, know that every first Friday of every month, I'm downtown, Bolt, downtown Denver at 17th and Winecoop in front of Union Station, in front of the big American flagpole on across the street, okay? In front of the, uh, uh, what's that Italian restaurant? The Venice restaurant, the Venice restaurant, right in front of that, okay? That's it, God bless you, man. I love you very much. You take care, please, please.